Dr. Baxter obtained her MD and PhD in clinical epidemiology from the University of Toronto. Uh, she's a board certified colonorectal surgeon and a fellow of the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons. She's currently head of the Division of General Surgery at St. Michael's Hospital and also holds a scientist position with the Lee Cushing Knowledge Institute and is a senior scientist at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. Dr. Baxter is also associate uh, Dean of Academic Affairs at the Della Lana School of Public Health and a professor in the Department of Surgery and Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. She holds the position of Provincial GI Endoscopy Lead for, the, for Cancer Care in Ontario. Uh, Dr. Baxter is a clinical epidemiologist and health services researcher interested in the effectiveness of cancer screening, long-term survivorship of cancer, and the quality of surgical care. She has extensive experience in the use of administrative data and cancer registry data to evaluate long-term consequences of cancer care for adults. So I think we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Baxter here. She's truly a leader in our field and is going to talk to us about what does a surgeon look like. I think, I think this is good. Is, is the mic working? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Andy. And you know, um, Andy and I uh, were ships that crossed in the night in Minnesota because I started off my career at University of Minnesota. And I took over a couple clinics that Andy had least been in uh, a few times uh, on a regular, well, actually on a relatively regular basis. And I know from the feedback I got from nurses that I didn't look quite like they were hoping for because dreamy Dr. Shelton had, uh, <laughs> had left the building. Anyway, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, um, uh, about uh, disparities and um, uh, and diversity within the house of surgery, specifically uh, as it relates to uh, gender. Um, and just um, just to tell you that I'm going to be using a fairly binary view of gender. Um, I didn't want uh, uh, people's heads to explode too much, um, but clearly, you know, gender is a spectrum, and um, and that I'm talking male female doesn't mean that I don't acknowledge that, and there aren't uh, many issues for our trans colleagues. Um, so uh, just, I'm not sure if many of you are familiar uh, with Frances Connolly. So she was a professor of neurosurgery at Stanford, um, who was a very prominent neurosurgeon in US surgery and actually quit her job at Stanford um, because of sexual harassment and wrote this book, Walking Out in the Boys. Um, this was, uh, I read this at the end of my training. Um, and this was the review from a New England Journal. So this was from uh, Merle Waxman, who's now the Director of Office of Women at Yale. Um, and this was in 1998. Although I share Conley's deep concern about equity for women in medicine and science and empathize with her impatience, I suspect like a nearly victorious but weary warrior, she cannot see that the battle is going well. Uh, I believe that universities and academic medical centers are in fact agents of social change. I know that prejudices and barriers are dissolving. Well, unfortunately, well, fortunately with colorectal surgery, when I was on the interview circuit, I mean, this is what I saw. So leaders in colorectal surgery uh, that, that are women um, and uh, people of my uh, generation of colorectal surgeons, also fantastic women. Um, so I, I thought that colorectal was an excellent place for uh, me to be my authentic self uh, and to succeed as an academic surgeon. Uh, but I'm just gonna tell you a little bit in this uh, lecture about um, my career and how it's, uh, um, how it's developed uh, and how I think gender has at least in part played uh, on the progress of, of, of me and many of my uh, colleagues. So we like to believe that we live in a perfect world uh, where there's uh, no racism, no sexism, no homophobia, uh, et cetera. But the reality is uh, that we don't. Um, and uh, as we know with the uh, um, Me Too, uh, in the Me Too era, um, that we're becoming more aware of how pervasive sexual harassment and sexual dis uh, discrimination based on um, gender is. Um, and what about Stanford? So Stanford uh, in the department, uh, in medical school, uh, we have 49.9% uh, females. And actually this is the first year that women have outnumbered uh, male medical students in the United States. In Canada, that's been the case since the 90s. Um, but now it uh, has uh, reached parity in the US. So in terms of your faculty, when I just look at your website, it's 32% women, um, but there are no division heads. Although you do get a real gold star for having a department head. Uh, uh, very few department heads uh, are women in United States, uh, and this is one uh, outstanding one. 
Um, but, uh, but, and in fact, the number and diversity of female faculty here uh, is remarkable. I've given this talk other places and this is, these aren't the numbers that I've presented. So, um, but still there are issues. And so one of the things I wanna make sure is that people don't take this as uh, somehow um, a blame game. I'm not blaming people. Uh, I want people to um, think about this uh, as just uh, the way it is, um, the way currently um, the world works uh, and uh, what we, um, and think about it in a way uh, of some, a problem we need to solve uh, versus um, thinking this is about how men are all sexist pigs. It's not what I'm trying to say. But equally, uh, I don't want people to take the attitude that this is just one more boring lecture on diversity or discrimination, um, that basically they just have to get through and, uh, and then can just uh, continue living their lives. So hopefully we'll be in the sweet spot someplace in between. So what does a surgeon look like? This is uh, Dr. Nikki Stamp. She's a thoracic, cardiothoracic surgeon in Australia. And she got sick of people asking if she was their surgeon. Um, so she made a t-shirt. This is what a surgeon looks like. Uh, and that started a campaign. And so this was fantastic in terms of having women feel like um, they had representation uh, and uh, women got together in terms of talking about their experiences. So I think it was very helpful. But is this really what a surgeon looks like? Is this really what people think a surgeon looks like? Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and I'm talk, gonna talk a little bit about why that matters and how that affects the lives of female surgeons and then a little bit about what we can do about it. Because the reality is that uh, in fact, this is far more what people think a surgeon looks like. Um, this is a, from my Facebook feed, from my uh, Twitter feed. So it's a, a Facebook comment that a friend of mine who's a trauma surgeon uh, posted in January. Today I walked into a room in the ER to examine my patient. Immediately a junior resident consulting on the patient asked me to adjust an infusion pump. This is, this is, uh, has about, uh, this is a hospital with uh, a third of the surgeons are women. Um, why do you assume I'm a nurse? I'm a nurse uh, she asked him. Well, you walked into the room. So let's have hands go up and stay up if you've ever been mistaken for a nurse, an orderly, or a housekeeper when you're in the hospital. So let's have the hands stay up and let's have the hands stay up if it's been in the last month. So I want someone who didn't put their hand up to tell me why that's important, why that has an impact on people. And I'll wait you out. It's demeaning, yeah, it's, why else? What happens when patients don't think you're the surgeon? They don't trust you, right? Surgery is a confidence game. You've got about 20 minutes to gain people's confidence that you're, they're putting their lives in your hands. It's a confidence game. If they don't think that you're actually the surgeon, it becomes that much more difficult to gain their confidence. At least when you're mistaken for a nurse, you're part of the healthcare team. When you're mistaken for an orderly, I mean, that, that's even more challenging. Well, why, why do we end up thinking that men look like surgeons and women look like nurses? Uh, well, part of it is to do with schema. So schema are cognitive frameworks that help us process information. You know, human beings can only process so much information at once, and it helps us understand our world. It helps us visually look at something and kind of understand, even if we only see part of it, exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's how we function, uh, and it's a very, very useful thing. I mean, we've developed it for a reason. It's because it helps us understand, interpret, and uh, act on our world. Um, but, you know, our, our schemas can limit us uh, as well. Um, and so what I want to, us to do is just to talk about what we think a surgeon schema is. So let's hear what we think a surgeon schema is. What's our kind of overall cognitive view of what a surgeon is? I took a, a seminar on increasing um, interaction uh, and basically, uh, you know, you just have to wait until people get uncomfortable enough that someone says something. Um, so, so just so you know, like you're not, you're not gonna, you're, you're not gonna um, beat me on this. I'm just gonna wait you out. Confident. Confident. In charge. Decisive. Hmm? At the back, someone at the back.
agentic, meaning capable of agency. We're doers. Um, so this is a word doodle from a from uh, something about the surgical personality. I love how this is one of the biggest things on the word doodle. Um, but this is kind of our surgical a schema of a surgeon, someone who takes action, someone who makes decisions, someone who's confident, um, someone who's successful, someone who sometimes can be a jerk. Uh, and this is from um, some research that I did looking at what medical students think of us. Uh, this is a long time ago, but I don't think a ton of it's changed. 5% uh, agreed that surgeons had a rewarding family life, and 10% of medical students agreed that surgeons enjoyed spending time with patients. So there's a certain view of us. I heard recently that we're not, what, what did you say uh, about uh, the TV surgery personality? Right, so you know, this is the TV surgical personality that, uh, that, that you know, it's part of the surgeon schema, right? It's our reality. Uh, yeah, where's the sex part? Well, the sex part's coming, actually, Andy. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, a little segue, but a little bit too soon. So what about the schema of uh, women? And I'll just tell you a little bit about my experience. So this is um, the layout for my hospital, and we're having construction in my hospital. It's, uh, you think that building your hospital's a nightmare. Building my hospital, we're building it while we're trying to actually work in the same hospital, and it's been a total nightmare for four years. In any event, it's kind of changed how you get to your office, so you're always going someplace new. So um, there's this spot by the Cardinal Carter elevators where suddenly things are blocked off and there's a guard. So there's a guard I've never seen before who's sitting there stopping you from going whichever way you want to go. So one day at about 7.30 or 8, I'm going home and I'm walking past him and I hear him mumble something. Uh, and it sounds kind of something about a horse. I don't really know what it is, so I keep walking by. So then I come in the next day, so I come in about 7 o'clock or maybe a little bit earlier and I walk by the same guy. So he's obviously doing um, his 12 hour shift and I'm obviously doing my, starting my 14. Uh, anyway, I walk by him and he's more, I managed to get something audible out that time uh, and it was, you sound like a horse. And I stopped and I just laid, laid into him. I let totally loose on him. Uh, in a way that was difficult for me to understand at the time. But basically, I was walking too loudly for this individual, and this individual felt entitled enough that he could tell me that he felt uh, that I was wa walking too loudly, because we just don't think that women should be allowed to walk that loudly. So, what is our view of women? So this is from Red, Red Pill Women. It's from a right-wing right, right wing kind of a, a, a website about how women should behave. And uh, so this is someone uh, asking for some advice about how to be feminine. Pay attention to how you walk and hold yourself, to how your hips sway when you walk in your posture. Yoga, Pilates, and dance are great ways to improve your poise. Pay attention to your resting face. Do you have an RBF? I, I don't know, how many of you uh, know me at all? Or, Arden. So how many people have experienced my RBF? Uh, it, it's the best in the business. Uh, uh, people, uh, people, we do a lot of mock orals in, um, in Toronto in preparation for exams and no one comes to me um, uh, at the beginning because they know they can't handle my RBF. Uh, an RBF or a gentle, easy smile. Are you light on your feet and graceful or heavy footed and trudging along? So I must say, in many ways, I, I don't meet the red pill woman uh, um, uh, view of uh, schema of what a woman should be. And I think many of us uh, in this audience, uh, uh, it would be similar. So what does society believe women should be even today? So there's a gender schema and there's society, society's beliefs about the traits of women and men. And this starts from very early. Children are socialized before they go to school, in fact. Uh, and then once they go to school, uh, if they're not fully socialized, it, it happens very, very quickly. So gender schemas form, and this uh, uh, influences what we consider to be acceptable behaviors and unacceptable behaviors, and that has influences on self-esteem for those that progress that. Uh, and that it also uh, influences the processing of social information. So uh, when someone behaves in a certain way, when someone uh, achieves a certain thing, we process it differently for men and for women. Um, and so what we end up with are uh, gender schemas, and you know, these different, Different people fulfill these in different ways, but these are the schemas that we have in general for men and women, uh, that women are nurturing, men are assertive, women are kind, men are ambitious, uh, women are helpful, men are agentic, capable of agency, women are sensitive, men are dominant, et cetera, et cetera. So which one is more similar to a surgeon? Yeah, yeah. 
So surgeon and men, woman and nurse. So we have this schema of a surgeon, schema of woman, and they kind of are at odds. Uh, there is a, um, uh, some kind of a schema, uh, a schism, uh, when you thought, think about a woman surgeon. And this is why when I Google women surgeon and get images, uh, I get this hottie. Um, or when uh, a kid whose surgeon's a mom, uh, who uh, has to find words that ha use the er, you are, uh, and puts down surgeon, they get corrected. That it's actually the hospital lady, it's actually a nurse, it's not a surgeon by their teacher. So I know Dr. Colonel Hutchison uh, came and spoke to you about implicit bias and how these schemas that we develop affect uh, the lived experience of, uh, of people uh, of a variety of, uh, of color, of, of women, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, and uh, I know that uh, he talked to you about the, uh, uh, the association test that Harvard does that you can do yourself to see uh, if uh, you have bias, and almost certainly you do, because we all do. Um, one of the important things about implicit bias is that it's pervasive and automatic. It's not something we should blame ourselves for, but we have to understand that it is pervasive, uh, and also that it's not fixed, that we can do something about it. Um, so I won't go into it much, implicit bias, much more than that, because I know that you've discussed it. But one of the things I want to talk about is, you know, I'm, I'm talking about female, male, male, uh, women, men, uh, and sexism, uh, and how um, schemas affect women's careers and lives. Um, but I don't want to kind of um, uh, diminish uh, issues that other, other people have. So this is from Toronto. So we think that we live in a multicultural world. Toronto uh, is one of the most multicultural places in uh, in the world, um, but uh, there's still a, a large amount of uh, racism, uh, sexism that occurs. And I think it's important as physicians we um, understand what our colleagues uh, are going through. So again, I'm not talking about going to be talking a lot about. Um, a lot about um, other forms of uh, discrimination or disparity, um, but that's not that I'm denying that they occur. Um, so why does this? Why do we end up with um, different career paths, different uh, and different rewards, different um, uh, achievements uh, because of uh, unconscious bias and because of the schemas that we have? And um, part of this is who controls the value system. Uh, and that in general, there's a, this is Sociology 101, and if some of you did Sociology 101, I apologize for my surgeon's interpretation of these things, it's fairly simplified. Um, but there's a dominant in-group that decides on um, who gets the rewards and who is celebrated, uh, and there's an excluded out-group. Um, and it's not difficult to understand who is the, uh, in the dominant in-group, and that will affect all of our lives. Um, and this is in part privilege. And privilege is a set of unearned benefits given to a group of people who fit into specific social groups. And I know many of you probably have your own view of what privilege is um, uh, and um, have opinions about whether this is a meaningful term or not. Um, but perhaps what we'll do is we'll just start with an example that's a little less emotionally laden than much of the um, discussion about privilege is. Um, and this is about handedness. So everyone who's right-handed, put up your hand and keep it up. How many of you have ever been handed a pair of scissors that aren't optimally designed to function with your dominant hand? People who are left-handed, put your hand up. How many in the last week have been handed a pair of scissors that were not optimally designed to be used with your dominant hand? All right, so we don't really think of uh, our right-handedness as privilege. We don't even think about our right-handedness. I mean, so people who are right-handed don't have to think about being right-handed. We live in a right-handed world. We live in a world that was designed for right-handed people. And we didn't ask to be born into a world that was designed for right-handed people. We just were. Uh, and we do reap some rewards by that, but it's not, not our fault. Uh, but I think that it is important that we kind of think about um, what happens to our left-handed colleagues. And in surgery, it's not a minor thing. Um, there are issues with being left-handed and being a surgeon. Would any of the left-handed people want to share any issues that they might have had in training or? Brooke, you had your hand up.
But were there any issues when you, you know? <laughs> that was one of them. Sherry, do you have any? Right. Well, I mean, there are some issues that have been um, identified for left-handed individuals that make it harder in training. Um, and, uh, you know, some of it is just kind of righties don't really understand how to um, help uh, left-handed people do the same moves uh, and that sometimes it can be hard to coordinate with a left-handed person and it makes it a little bit more uncomfortable for people in training. Um, <clears throat> you know, the other thing is we don't know if maybe just being that little bit more awkward because you're left-handed in a right-handed world might affect who we perceive is going to be a good surgeon or not. So um, there are issues with even this and there's a privilege of being right-handed, not something we think about all the time. But this, of course, extends into many areas of our lives. The things that people who aren't part of that dominant in-group have to deal with um, sometimes on a daily basis. Um, and so this is, <clears throat> this is from the, um, one of the other issues. Um, this is from the um, Association of Women Surgeons and God love them, they are trying. They're trying to help women kind of um, fully participate in a male dominant world. Um, this is some advice that they give in their pocket mentor to women, women in surgical training. In some cases, an older man will call you dear or pat you on the shoulder. This may seem paternalistic and demeaning, but it may be how he was raised to treat women. He may perceive his actions as being polite and respectful to your femininity rather than offensive. Don't confuse courtesy with chauvinism. Nothing irritates a guy more than a woman who gets angry when he opens the door for her. In most cases, this is not harassment. Well, actually, this is never harassment. Oops, oh, what did I just do? This is actually microaggression. This isn't harassment. This is a comment or an action that's subtly and often unintentionally hostile or demeaning to a group of a minority or a marginalized group. So you don't mean to be offensive when you do it. You think it's polite, but actually it, it reinforces uh, a stereotype to the individual uh, and it is a way of just kind of diminishing um, their, uh, their belongingness. So it's a microaggression. And what I want to emphasize is that many, of, many men here might be saying, well, not me, I'm, I'm open, I, I'm not that biased or uh, I'm not biased at all, um, that it's not all men. And certainly like egregious things, most men don't, don't do egregious things and don't have egregious biases towards uh, women. Um, but it does happen and it's happened to all women. I'm sure if we polled here, all women have experience, in this room have experienced some form of um, disparity or discrimination related to their sex. Um, but also women are part of the problem, right? We are part of society and that school teacher, you know, I'm gonna assume she was a woman. Again, this is my um, uh, bias, but correcting um, the child for saying the surgeon should have been the nurse. Um, so yes, all women are too um, uh, part of society and we all have our, our biases as well that affect women. So we're all biased. Uh, and uh, again, I'm not going to talk a lot about race, but I do want to just say briefly that there is an intersectionality. So um, things are difficult for women, things are particularly difficult for women of color. So there's an intersection between race and gender that's important to consider as well. Um, well, so these biases don't just happen from, um, from um, uh, society uh, in terms of um, how we, we are evaluated and how we progress. They're also uh, something that's part of the lived experience of um, surgeons dealing with their patients. So this is a Medscape survey that looked at uh, bias uh, from patients and how frequently it happens. Uh, it happens frequently to men and women, but more frequently to, to women than men. The other thing is that uh, women tend to be more affected by the bias that they're exposed to. So this uh, looked at how much of an impact the experience of bias had to um, physicians who had experienced bias and women were more likely to say that they were uh, moderately or strongly affected by it, potentially because uh, this builds on a scaffold of a lifetime of microaggressions and experiences of bias that women have had during the course of their life. And this has a, a direct impact on how the, uh, the schemas and bias has a direct impact on how we progress. Um, this is from Caprice Greenberg's uh, lecture on um, sticky floors and glass ceilings. I suggest you uh, look it up if you want to um, hear more about this. But uh, definitely it affects women's progress in, um, in 
academic medicine. So this looks at the year of completion of residency for women in academic medicine and looks at their progress through the ranks um, and looks at cohort effects. So it doesn't just look at all women, it looks at women who uh, completed residency in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s to adjust for a time period. Uh, and what you show is irrespective of what cohort these women finished in, they were less likely to achieve associate and full professor, so less likely to progress through the ranks. Additionally, uh, when you look at compensation, um, there's a major difference between men and women in general surgery in terms of compensation. And when you adjust for things like, uh, you know, amount of uh, hours spent, uh, time off for childbearing, um, there's still 40% of this difference is unexplained by uh, anything to do with the amount of work we do. Uh, and that is actually 2.5 million over a career. So it has major impact on our lives. And it's not because we do worse work. Um, this is some uh, work that was published by one of my colleagues in Toronto, Natalie Coburn, that actually looks at uh, operative outcomes comparing uh, female surgeons to male surgeons and actually shows that uh, in terms of 30-day mortality, uh, you're better off being treated by a female surgeon than a male surgeon. Um, and you know, even for the best of the best, this has uh, an effect, uh, and even the best of the best uh, experience uh, these um, uh, issues related to uh, gender and bias. So this is uh, a sur survey of K08 and K23 co career development awardees uh, and looked at their experience uh, through their careers. Uh, and um, uh, you know, the majority of women had uh, actual, well, almost the majority of women had experienced uh, some gender specific bias uh, during their career. And this, um, uh, for those uh, experiencing harassment, um, actually, uh, you know, many sexist remarks and behaviors, but um, uh, more serious um, uh, behavior in and experiences in, uh, in a significant number of women who are at the top of the pyramid in terms of academic success. So I'd just like to talk a little bit about the Harvey Weinstein moment uh, and how things may or may not um, change uh, with this particular moment in time. Uh, and this is a big issue. It's a big issue for our departments. It's a big issue for our academic centers. Um, I think that there we have the tip of the iceberg and there's going to be a lot more coming. Um, this is from a while ago, but this is one of the largest sexual harassment awards. Uh, it was in California. It was in a medical center. It was 168 million. Uh, and I think that more awards like this, more cases like this are going to be coming. And certainly there's a lot of stuff in California in terms of academia. Uh, and uh, almost certainly there are things happening in surgery that have not been reported and that will be reported and that we're going to have to deal with. And I, I think that there are ways that we can deal with it that uh, will limit the liability of our institutions. And if we don't we'll deal with them properly, I think there'll be huge liabilities for in our institutions. Well, one of the things that people always say is, um, this is going to get better as uh, we get more and more women in the profession. Uh, there'll be more women in leadership, and so these issues will improve. Uh, and one of the things I'd like to emphasize is unless we do something that's different than what we're doing today, um, the pipeline's not going to work for us. So this looks at uh, women uh, in medical school and how, uh, as you look as, um, as influence uh, progressively increases, there are fewer and fewer women proportionally represented. So uh, almost 50% in, um, in this figure in medical school now, 50%, but by the time you get to department head and dean, you have a much lower uh, percentage women. And, and this is, uh, reaching 50% women is not gonna solve this in the short term. As I said, in Canada, we've been over 50% women in medical school since the 90s. We've been over 40% women in medical school since the 80s. Uh, and if you looked at the department head dean level, it would be very similar to this in Canada. So uh, we have a pipeline, but the pipeline leaks. And so what we do about our leaky pipeline is going to determine um, what happens in leadership. Uh, this, in, the, in the corporate world, they talk about how long it's going to take if we just allow things to continue and rely on the pipeline for women to have uh, equal, um, equal representation at the highest level, and it'll be 200 years. And so what is the, what's, what's the mechanism? What actually happens that affects our progress, uh, affects how we are able to uh, function fully as surgeons? 
Well, one of the big things is prove it again. Because we see men as surgeons, we see men as successful, we see men as agentic. Uh, when men succeed, it confirms our schema. Uh, when women succeed in surgery, it doesn't, it's not necessarily confirming our schema. We don't expect women to fail, but we don't necessarily expect them to success, uh, succeed in the same way. And so this ends up um, having this difference between potential and performance. So men tend to be judged on their potential. Women tend to be judged on their performance in terms of things like advancement, uh, hiring, et cetera. Um, the playing field can shift where, um, you know, the criteria set for a job ends up varying depending on who applies. And surprise, surprise, the criteria end up favoring uh, a certain type of person and it tends not to be women. And then there's also double standards. So um, what uh, is okay for, for a man may not be okay for a woman in the same um, scenario. Uh, and this, this definitely happened to me and definitely affected my career progress. So when I moved back to Canada, um, I was in my, finishing my fourth year of my, um, of my academic appointment. Uh, and I was expecting to be um, uh, promoted pretty soon at University of Minnesota. And I moved back to Canada, mainly for personal reasons. And uh, all of my friends, when they moved, got promoted. Uh, and so, basically, I said I want to be promoted to associate professor. And so my boss, um, uh, my, the chief of my department, counted up my publications and said, you know, I, I don't really think so. I think you're going to have to, you know, be here for a couple of years and apply. Uh, and my, my immediate boss said, you know, I, I just, you know, if that's what you want, I really can't push for that. So that's going to, you're, you're going to have to decide whether you're okay with it or not. Which, you know, I thought, all right, well, Toronto has super high standards. It's like the Harvard North, although that's McGill. But anyway, so Toronto likes to think of itself as the Harvard North. Um, but then you saw men being interviewed and men coming on with less on their CV than I had that were going to be promoted, were going to be brought on as associate professor. It's clearly gendered. Um, so, it, so it delayed my promotion by about three years. And that has economic impact. It has all kinds of impact. And so um, it affects uh, how people get seen at interviews. So this is from um, an ENT um, program. So the ENT program has implemented standardized letters of recommendation. Um, but not everyone, obviously, in otolaryngology has. So they get um, letters from um, uh, elsewhere, some of which are in standardized form and some of which are not in standardized form. So they decided to compare what the standardized letters look like to what the, um, the non-standardized letters look like. So in the standard, standardized letters, the only difference was that women were more likely to be described as team players, which may think we may think is positive, but actually in surgical specialties probably isn't because people are probably looking for more agentic individuals. But that was the only difference. But when they looked at the narrative, the, 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 um, the non-standardized forms, uh, men were more likely to be described as having leadership position, uh, potential. Women were less likely to be described as being bright and more likely to have their appearance mentioned. And a um, number of studies have shown these kind of things, and these are some things to watch, watch for uh, when you're um, writing letters of recommendations. So letters of recommendations for physicians, women's letters compared to men are shorter and four times less likely to specifically mention their publications or research. Uh, they're half as likely to mention accomplishments and more doubts are raised. So things are like they're hardworking, dependable. They talk about um, personality traits. Uh, and they don't talk about ability uh, or use superlatives like best or excellent. So these are things to think about when you're writing your uh, reference letters. Um, and definitely there are a large number of studies that have looked at just subtle biases and how they can affect um, um, our progress. And this is one that looked at um, uh, science faculty uh, looking for a lab manager. And so this was something called an audit study. There are lots of audit studies out there. So they took two identical CVs, labeled one John and one Jill. Uh, and what they found uh, was that uh, faculty who looked at these CVs rated the male applicant as significantly more competent and hireable than the identical female applicant. Um, they thought that the male applicant should have a higher starting salary and thought that they'd offer more career mentoring to the male applicant. The gender, importantly, of the participant of the rater did not affect the responses. So women thought men were better just like men thought men were better. So again, it's not kind of men are sexist pigs. I guess we're all sexist pigs. 
Um, and so if you don't believe this study, there are literally hundreds of audit studies that demonstrate that John is more likely to be hired, more likely to be rated as competent, more likely to be considered worthy of promotion and mentorship, et cetera, than Jane. Audit studies, so same CV, just mixed up the name. But interestingly, when you show these two men and women, men are more likely to question the science of these studies than women are. And why might that be? In part, I think this is a bit of the tyranny of the meritocracy. So we think we live in a meritocracy where the world is fair and the very best come to the top and it's through their achievements uh, and it's through their innate ability. Um, and we have a desire to really believe that the system is fair and based on ability. All of us want to work and live in a fair system. We also believe that we ourselves are objective and that we arise above all of this. Um, and additionally, we tend, are all fairly high up on the apex of the pyramid. And so if the system is not merit-based, it destabilizes our own self-concept. So perhaps we didn't just succeed because we're fantastic people. Perhaps there was, the, we were judged in different ways than others. So it affects our entire self-concept, which is very, very uncomfortable. Um, in my own department, we have um, in-group favoritism. So this is, um, and you know, it's not something that you think about, and it's not the, that these people want to exclude women, but this was the department of hockey, of, of surgery hockey team. Our chief of our department was an excellent, excellent hockey player. He could have been um, a, a, in the lower level professional leagues. So obviously, if you're playing in the departmental hockey team, this is something that might get you more face time with the department chief. I don't care about hockey. Um, <laughs> there is no, um, you know, uh, opera uh, appreciation team. Um, but I, I, I'm okay though with being left out of this. But these are our lectures for our, um, you know, our, our uh, research day, which is our premier um, speaker opportunity. We invite, you know, a very prominent surgical scientist, uh, and there has never been a female uh, speaker at this. So I don't care about the hockey team, but I do care about how it ends up um, uh, boiling down to who we decide um, to invite as um, the uh, representative of, um, of surgical scientists uh, in the world. Um, I did this uh, recent, I looked at the number of female and male presenters at our, our grand rounds like these ones. Uh, and so I have now have the David to woman ratio and the David to woman ratio is one to one. And I'm hoping we can do better than that next year. So twice as many women as David's. Something to hope for. Um, all right, so the other thing that women have to do, so women, once they have gotten up to a leadership position, they have to walk this tightrope. And um, men uh, need to be competent. Um, women need to be likable. So when you get to leadership roles, if you're not likable, you can end up getting a bit of a blowback um, because people have, uh, if you're competent, you tend to be seen as not likable. And that's not the same for men. And I see a few women nodding. Um, and this is uh, not kind of news to most people who've been in this position. So you have to walk this tightrope where you have to try to be competent but try to be likable. And that can be very, very challenging. And so leading while female, you end up being bossy. And people don't necessarily like that coming from a woman. And they don't know why they don't like that. They don't even perceive that that's part of uh, their gender schema. But it becomes much more of a challenge to lead as a woman. And this is some advice from Julie Freischlag. Um, so Susan Pitt kind of wrote this out as some great advice for leaders. I think she meant it as leaders in general, but I, I think it's specific advice for female leaders that you have to under-promise and over-deliver. Uh, you have to communicate. You have to accept imperfection. You have to be nice because it matters. Um, because, and you have to share credit and don't share blame, et cetera, et cetera. So I think these are really good ways for women to lead. I don't think men have to abide by quite the same criteria in terms of leading. And this is from a qualitative study that we did looking at um, women's experience. And again, it speaks to leading, not at the department level, but uh, how we lead as surgeons. I think you always have to tread on really thin ice when you're a woman, because like, you're sort of quick to, they're sort of quick to talk behind your back in a less respectful way. So I've learned to get my way, I just have to stop talking, just say nothing. And I don't think it works the same way for guys. Like when they cancel my case and stuff, ranting and raving and going to the front desk does absolutely nothing. It actually works against me. Whereas now I've learned to just sit outside the OR and just wait, and then they always come through. And I think it, if it's the other way around, if it's a male surgeon's case, he would go up and they would, and would say, come on, then the outcome would be different. And I see a lot of nodding. 
Yeah. The other thing I want you to think about, so the next meeting you go to, I want you to think about power dynamics and how they affect how meetings run. So I want you to think about who gets interrupted, who gets listened to, or who actually says something, because women are only about 50% as likely to say something at meetings uh, that have mixed genders. Who gets credit for ideas, and who does the housework? And what do I mean by the housework? The housework is um, the stuff that needs to get done, that somebody has to do within a division, within a department, um, but it's not stuff that's associated with uh, money, it's not associated with uh, accolades, it's not gonna get you promoted, but it's gotta be done. And you know, I, I challenge you to take a look at who's actually doing that in your own um, uh, organization. Uh, and the stolen idea. So I don't know if uh, many of, uh, I think most women are familiar with this, but so someone has said something in a group meeting and then some, suddenly someone else says the same thing and everyone says, wow, that's a great idea. Whereas they didn't really listen to the initial person that said it. Um, somehow it seems, sounds so much better when it's said in a deeper tone, um, somehow. Uh, it's a common, uh, a common experience. One of the other things that's really important to uh, understand is how motherhood and potential motherhood can be ex an excuse and can end up driving these types of biases. There's a motherhood penalty. So when someone comes back from mat leave, they end up being held to a higher standard. So if they leave early, everyone assumes they're leaving early because it's something to do with their kids. If a guy leaves early and, or a woman leaves early and they haven't just come back from mat leave, no one knows why they've left. They don't necessarily make those assumptions. They're not offered opportunities because people assume they don't want them, that they're too busy for uh, you know, that extra OR time. Um, so they don't offer them opportunities that they might take or they might not take. And then when they do take opportunities, they're judged. They're judged as bad mothers. So why would they take that extra OR time? They're not spending enough time with their kids. And this has an impact on women without children as well, both because people assume that women are going to have children and kind of build their career for them so that they can have children in their career. And also women who don't have children tend to end up being um, uh, given more assignments and duties, uh, not necessarily great assignments and duties because they presumably have more time. Well, why do we care about it? Um, I think women care about it, but why should we all care about it? Well, it comes with a very high cost. So these systematic um, uh, discrimination and disparities uh, come at high cost for all individuals who are not part of that favored in-group. To individuals, to organizations, and to culture. So these are all subtle biases. No one is going to come out and say that they didn't, or even think to themselves that they didn't give me a promotion because of my, um, my gender. Um, so it's subtle bias, and it, in ways it can be worse than overt bias, because you're left trying to understand the reasons. So why wasn't my CV adequate? And trying to understand exactly how I could do better. Well, if it's actually because I'm a woman, it's hard to, to change that. So you spend a lot of cognitive and emotional resources trying to understand what happened. It also can occur with high frequency. So part of the reason why women may be more sensitive to bias from patients is because they experience it all the time and you end up getting a certain level where you just, uh, it ends up uh, being difficult to, um, to tolerate, it ends up leading to burnout, et cetera. And partly explains my reaction to that guy. So like why did I just lay into that guy uh, I, I ended up complaining about him and he was gone the next day. But why did I lay into him like that? And the reason I laid into him like that, despite the fact that it was ridiculous, this guy talking about the way I walked uh, and not really understanding the power differential between the two of us. Well, uh, part, I, I, I reacted that way because it was humiliating and you're kind of sick of being humiliated. Additionally, there's no legal recourse. So there's no way that I can sue for not being promoted because like, Maybe I wasn't adequate, maybe I wasn't good enough. So only overt episodes of bias are actually going to result in awards. So sometimes subtle bias can be worse than overt bias. Although overt bias, certainly I'm not saying it's not, not good. And what happens, so that leaky pipeline, how does that work? So how do we get from this subtle bias to actually having a system that, we're designing a system, what did you say Mary, designing the system that produces the result? Right, so how did we design the system? Well, what happens is it's a feedback loop. So when you have fewer people, when you have a minority that's in a profession, they, they have something called an evaluation bias. So what they do is subtly not 
um, uh, rated the same, tends to be under rated lower than someone who's expected to do well. So their performance is underestimated. So then they end up getting less publications, less grants, et cetera, or, or publishing in a lower impact journal. It ends up giving you lower career success and it confirms the schema. So you end up getting this loop that uh, when you don't have a critical mass that keeps going around and around and around. And it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much to end up um, uh, on that loop that uh, results in um, disparities as you progress along the um, along your career. So this is a, a modeling study that looked at um, what would happen as you progress through a company that has eight levels. So the company has eight levels to the very top of the pyramid and at each level you get evaluated and the best people on that evaluation get promoted up. So you start with 50% women at the bottom um, and then you just see what happens as the computer model goes to the top. If everyone has the same evaluations, then you should have 50% at the top and 50% at the bottom. So this is what happens if you only have a 5% difference between women and men at each level of that hierarchy. And what you can see is by the time you get to the eighth level, um, you end up with uh, a big difference between the number of men and the number of women at the top of that heap and that's only with a 5% difference in each evaluation. So it's easy to see how that can happen. So the system is perfectly designed to deliver the results it delivers. And again, why is this important? Well, it's important from a, a corporate, and cult, uh, corporate culture perspective because we know that diverse and inclusive work uh, forces actually demonstrate um, a greater team commitment, more collaboration, they're more likely to have innovative ideas and people are happier to work there so you end up with more career retention. I happen to know a, a, a significant number of women who have left institutions because they have not felt rewarded or welcomed. And it's, Mary, it's expensive to recruit. Much easier to retain. M not easier, it's much less expensive to retain. Uh, and there's also a compelling interest in terms of our patients. So patients deserve and should be treated by, by people that at least have an opportunity to see people in the medical workforce that represent them. Um, so I think that it's uh, extremely important and allows uh, us to understand the issues that affect all of our patients if we have uh, a workforce that's engaged and uh, welcomes diversity. And I think it's particularly important for places like Stanford that have really started uh, walking the talk uh, and have a large proportion of both their faculty and their residents are women. I saw this from the Stanford. Uh, it's amazing, the number of women here. Um, but I think what's really important is that we make sure the women at Stanford have an equal opportunity to succeed um, as, as the men. Um, and I think that that's something that we need to work on in the future because the system wasn't broken. It was built this way. So what can we do? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some tactics, tools, and strategies to actually make a difference. Um, I'm gonna first tell you what doesn't work. Diversity training and sexual harassment training don't work. In fact, some of the studies that have looked at training people on um, uh, unconscious bias have actually shown it makes it worse because people then understand that everyone has these biases so they can give themselves a, <laughs> everyone's got them so they can give themselves a pass. So these kind of things, they don't work. I mean, I think they give us a baseline knowledge, but it's hard to believe that men don't know that they shouldn't be groping women, right? I mean, you can teach them that, and from a corporate standpoint, I guess it lets you off the hook in some way, but you know, it's not like men need to be told that they can't grope people uh, on the job. Um, so one of the things is to become an ally. So this is never gonna happen with just women um, trying to make this happen. This has to be something that we all engage in. So we all have to be allies. And so um, women, men need to be allies for women. Women need to be allies for people, transgender people, um, the LGBT community, for, for people of color, et cetera. We all need to be allies for other people. We all need to think about others' experiences and how, um, how these uh, unconscious bias can affect the everyday ability for people to uh, succeed in their careers. One of the ways we can be allies, so this is what happened um, with Obama's staff. 
So actually the female staff found that they weren't being heard, that their ideas were being stolen, um, that they weren't being um, uh, enabled to succeed in terms of um, their, um, their contributions. And so what they actually came up with was a plan to amplify each other's voices. So when a woman made a good point, another woman amplified that, so reiterated it and attributed it to that initial individual. Um, the other thing that you can do is if somebody else takes up the point and doesn't attribute it, another woman can say, oh, hey, Joe, thanks for you know, adding to what Jane said, because I think it's really important that we all think that that's a great idea. The simple low risk thing that you can do to amplify the voices of women in the room, and we can all do this. Um, the other thing is, I think it's important that we all think about what we say and how it would say to how it would sound uh, if we uh, applied it in a slightly different way. So I have absolutely nothing against fathers in the workforce as long as they can concentrate on the job. I have no problem with you being heterosexual, but perhaps you shouldn't make it so obvious to patients. It's so great to see white students in our program. It's terrific that University of Toronto is focusing on diversity. So I think it's important just to think about what you say and how it would sound if you use it, the dominant in-group instead. In terms of the motherhood, um, the motherhood um, issues and how that ends up affecting people's career, importantly, don't assume that someone doesn't want a job assignment or extra OR time because she's a mother. You can offer it and they can say no. And don't assume that someone can take on a job, duty, or role because they're not a mother. And then, <laughs> let's, not, let's not choose the Mike Pence route, uh, where, um, where you know, our reaction to, to these issues is to basically say, uh, I'm not going to uh, mentor female uh, trainees, I'm not going to teach female students, et cetera, because they're gonna accuse me of harassment. I mean, you know, it, there is such a high bar to accuse people of harassment. In general, it is an incredibly negative thing for people's career, the person who actually makes the accusation. Um, that uh, I don't think you have to worry about, um, you know, your interactions with medical students or with uh, colleagues, normal interactions resulting in harassment lawsuits. So instead of doing something like that, what can we do? I think that there are a lot of things, but relying on the pipeline isn't what we should do. We have to think about how we innovate within our corporations, within our academic communities, to try to decrease the effect of bias. We're not gonna change the fact that we all have biases. What we have to do is change the effect of bias.